Uh, I think I mentioned last week that I'm pushing to get us to Micah 5 because that's the Christmas passage in Micah. This morning we are going to watch the text hawkishly. You know what that means? We're really going to zero in on it. And I say that because the sermon this morning has no points. Typically my sermons have three or four points, and usually the last point is arbitrary because I never get to it anyway. But uh, uh, this morning's sermon has no points, but I'm hoping it's not a pointless sermon. Uh, what, what we are going to do this morning is we're going to look at the first eight verses of chapter 4, we're going to zero in on them, and we're going to watch them hawkishly. We're going to try and observe exactly what the Lord is saying here because we begin this new portion uh, of the second major division. Remember, each of the three divisions, we've discussed this several times, but just for your uh, remembering, each of the three major divisions has two sections in it. Section one is always judgment. Section two is always grace and hope. In the first major division, section one, or the, the section on judgment was long. In the second major division, the section on judgment was brief. It was only contained in chapter three. And the section on hope and on grace is found in chapters four and five. And so as we look at chapters four and five, we are going to see that God is, uh, uh, his characteristic is that he is a God of grace and mercy. This is what irritates the liver out of me when somebody says, well, you know, I read the Old Testament and the God of the Old Testament, he's just a big meanie. The God of the Old Testament is just and he is holy, but he is not capricious. He does not pass judgment without reason and he does not offer judgment without hope. And so we see as we go through this, that our God is truly a good God. Now, we recognize that His goodness does not negate His holiness, nor does it take away from His justice, but yet the very fact that He is good assures us that every judgment that He passes is a righteous judgment. And every uh, uh, person that endures anything that they endure in this life, they endure it, righteously because our God is righteous. We have to come to grips with that if we are going to walk in faith on this earth because there are people who have this unending desire to understand God. And I would like to say to you this morning that if you have a desire to understand God, take your head to the nearest brick wall, smack it off of it once and see how that feels. If you think that you didn't get the message, smack it off a second time. If you're still a little thick, go ahead and smack your head a third time if necessary. If you knock yourself out, that's okay. Obviously, you don't use your head much anyway. Because if you believe that you somehow have the ability to understand God, you do not know the difference between infinite and finite. The difference between infinite means that it is above our ability to reason and understand. Finite is what we can comprehend. This is wood. I know that. I can comprehend it. It's finite. This is wood. <laughs> Some of the times. <laughs> we understand that. We can grasp that. I know who you are. I can understand you. You know, people come up to me and they're amazed. They'll say to me, you know, well, pastor, you don't know what I did. I can understand what you've done. You know why? Because I'm in the same boat. We're human. We are finite. But God is infinite. He is above us. You know, the great descent in history to where we are today has begun with the fact that people have rejected the doctrine of the Trinity. And as they rejected the doctrine of the Trinity, we see in this nation, they began to de devolve themselves into Unitarians, and then into Deists, and then from Deists into Agnostics, and then from Agnostics into Atheists, and now we have today the bitter atheists. You know who the bitter atheists are? They're the people that hate God and anything that smacks of God. What we are doing right here this morning is hated by the world. 
They don't want us in here. Listen, we have people in our government today in the United States of America who hate you and everything that you stand for, and they are desiring to present legislation into this nation that would bar you from being able to come into this church and worship. Because the world cannot understand the infinite. And they think, and this has been helped along by the philosophers who believe and who taught that just if you can't understand it, then it must not be true. So we have, uh, you know, Descartes who said, I think, therefore I am, you know, and, and, and that's supposed to be passed off as some sort of radical philosophy, and we're all supposed to be sitting around here going, wow. I think, therefore I am. Do you know what he's saying? Do you know what that statement means, I think, therefore I am? It means because I think, then I must exist. Listen, you exist because God has created you. But all of philosophy is driving to try and remove God from the creative power. All of science is driving to try and remove God from the creative power. Because if they can achieve that, then Nietzsche can be you know, uh, uh, vindicated for saying that God is dead. But the reality is clear. That is, each one of these philosophers are added to the ash heap of history. God is still on his throne. And each one of their philosophies has risen and has fallen, and the earth is no better for it. They have been nothing but Nephilim in the land, giants and destroyers. And they have led to the destruction of what we hold dear. And so we see that the God of the Old Testament is vastly different than the God that the world tries to paint him to be. The world tries to say that God is uncaring. The world tries to say that God is uh, uh, vindictive. The world tries to say that God is hateful. But yet the Old Testament bears out the fact that our God is an awesome God in whom we must stand continuously in awe of. If you don't know him today, then I have news for you. Jesus is the only way. This is what we're dealing with as we begin this section. Let's read it. In verse 1 it says, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree. And none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all people will walk, every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that holdeth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her that holdeth a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever." And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come. Even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Here, once again, the Bible critics attempt to dismantle the scriptures. 
They say that it is absolutely impossible for Micah to declare such harsh judgment and then move to declare such hope. Remember at the end of chapter 3, we see what God has pronounced on Zion. Remember Zion is Jerusalem, the city of God. Therefore shall Zion for your sake be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of the forest. So we see that Jerusalem has been declared destruction upon it. And Bob dealt with this morning in Sunday school in uh, uh, whatever book he was in. I can't remember. Haggai. Yeah, I couldn't remember there for a minute. I was going to say Habakkuk, but I was like, no, not Habakkuk. In in Haggai, he talked about the fact that uh, when they came to Jerusalem, all that was left was a rubble when they came out of exile. And so this declaration will come to pass. The city will be destroyed. But we must remember that the Bible critics should never have the last word on the Bible. Uh, I would even advance that the Bible critics shouldn't have the first word on the Bible. If you are seeking knowledge from Bible critics, you are going to find knowledge that is tainted because it has been drinking at the well water of this world, and it is a cistern that is broken and cannot contain the precious truths of God's Word. That's me nicely saying that I abhor modern scholarship on the Scriptures. Harvard... And Harvard's Divinity School is a den of thieves when it comes to the Word of God. And every Divinity School in every major school across this nation is morally and religiously bankrupt, and it is unworthy of our attention. We are the people of God, and we hear the Word of God. We do not listen to the pundits who declare the Word of God to be only so-so. The Word of God is our breath and our life. It is why my cousin's family can face uh, Jody's dad lying on the the ventilator, knowing that he's probably not going to make it through the next few days. They can face it with hope and joy because she said one glorious truth is, I know where dad is going. Why do we know that? Because the Bible has given us the road map. We do not live off of any other truths. This is our axiom. This is our truth. This is what we rest upon. And so when somebody attacks the Word of God, you know, we should, as they would say in the Old West movies, we should get our dander up. And I am amazed at how many pastors will read from these faulty books and then go and declare to their people, well, you know, I just don't know that Micah got it right here. It's astounding. Micah got it absolutely right because Micah was writing under divine inspiration, and we're told that in the New Testament. So what the Bible critics are declaring is that God truly is not a God of mercy. Or of grace because he has declared judgment obviously judgment cannot be coupled with grace and mercy but we would cry foul because we see clearly in God's Word that his entire program is built on the fact that his judgment is attached with his grace and his mercy what is grace God giving you what you don't deserve what is mercy God not giving you what you do deserve. What do you deserve? Judgment without hope. What does God give? Judgment with hope. That's the God that we serve. Chapter 3 is God's disinheritance of the leaders of the people of Israel. But chapter 4 shows that not all of Israel will be eternally rejected. Dale Ralph Davis likens this to, he he says, imagine that a 90-something-year-old man who has a great deal of wealth decides to go into his lawyer one day and change his will because he has a drunk for a son who has been a wastrel all of his life, and he decides that he is going to disinherit his son, and he is going to pass on his possessions to his grandchildren who have been faithful and have lived righteously. He said, it's the same picture. 
He said, God is saying to the people who have squandered the inheritance of the land that he is done dealing with them. But their children have hope because he will bring them back into the land and he will give them a place where they can rejoice. Now verses 1 to 4 are a mixed message of hope and judgment. Why? Because it is a judgment to the present generation, but it is a hope to the future generation. The opening phrase declares it that. It says, but in the last days. This is a futuristic prophecy that is speaking of an event that has not yet come to pass. It is not a message of hope to the people of Micah's day. Micah is saying, look, because of your stupidity, this is what we all have to face. But. Our future generations will be able to rejoice in the God that we have rejected. The present generation will have no place in the land of delight. Now let's just take this one verse at a time, as I said earlier. Verse 1 begins with a but. This but is to be a sharp contrast to what has gone on before. To this point in this division, there has been nothing but gory words of death and destruction. Remember, we talked even last week how God declared that uh, the best butcher shop in town were the political leaders. But the but lets us know that a change is happening. We move from the gory words of death to the glory words of life. Fisher says in verses 1 to 4 that they give us a comprehensive and a spiritual glimpse at the kingdom that will come. This is to show us clearly that God has not utterly abandoned his people Israel and Israel will have a personal rule in the land when God himself in the person of Jesus Christ rules. And he also declares that the destroyed temple will have an eternal foundation and it will be restored. Now, the phrase about higher than the other hills in verse 1 where it says that it shall be exalted above the hills, well, this is not a statement of topography, but this is a claim uh, or a put down against other religions. The rebellious people would worship in high places. And what the prophet Micah is saying is that God's worship will be higher than all the high places put together. Do you hear that? That is a very narrow statement. And I want you to get this. Our God will not allow coexistence with other religions. There is no allowing in God's kingdom of any religion that is not rooted in Him. There will be no worshiping the trees. There will be no cutting down and forming idols. There will be no walking amongst the, the gods, little g, of this world. My friend uh, Eliezer from India said that he was going to market the one day and he said he saw a guy riding his bicycle and he had a wagon attached to the bicycle. And what he had in the wagon was a statue. The statue was his God. And the man was pulling his God in his wagon because unfortunately for him, his God is not omnipresent. And so he must take him along. Listen. I didn't bring God with me and I don't take God with me anywhere I go. I show up somewhere and He is there. That's the idea of omnipresence. You understand this? Our God is greater than any of these gods, little g. And this is what is being declared by the prophet Micah. There is no such thing as coexist. As a matter of fact, if you really look at the, the, the have you ever seen the bumper sticker that says coexist? And the very first symbol is the symbol of the Muslims they would have no other coexistence. They're more true to their religion than most Christians are. Most Christians would say, why can't we all get along? They understand why we can't all get along. The Muslims do. They understand that Allah will have no other God than Allah. Why can't the Christian understand that the one true God will have no other God than himself? And there is no worship 
of any God that is acceptable to him that is not directed towards him. So we see he caps this whole scene with a phrase that's intended to cause rejoicing amongst us even today here in Catanning. The very last line of verse 1 says, and the people shall flow unto it. This is to cause us to get all excited and go tell everybody that Jesus Christ is King because all of the people will flow unto it. What a glorious thought that this is a period of time that is coming when all of the people who are left on this earth will recognize the supremacy of our Lord Jesus Christ. And He will rule and reign from His father David's throne. And no one will be able to set themselves against Him. He will be installed on a literal throne. And the nations will literally flow to Him. That should be encouraging to us. Especially when we look around at the world today in the midst of this asininity that we call life. What a future hope. And you know what's even greater? We could be that generation. We could be that final generation before His throne is established. I preach every sermon with the expectation that it is my last. And I preach every sermon when I mount these steps, I mount them with a recognition that I could halfway through this sermon be interrupted, hear a trumpet sound, and I'm gone. My question is, would this church be empty? My prayer is that this church would be empty, but if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you'll be shocked when this fat boy drops his flesh and is gone. We could be that final generation. Verse 2 says, And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. This is another encouragement for us. Here we see that the people that, that uh, Paul speaks of in Ephesians 2.12 that are coming to the rod of Jesse, the son of David, this is the idea that we're getting. What do they come to him for? They come to him for a specific reason. They want to learn of his ways. They want to learn how to walk in his paths. This is to cause us to be excited. What we talked about earlier about coexistence, they're going to recognize that it will not work. And they're going to say, the nations are going to say, we don't want to walk in our paths anymore. We want to walk in Christ's paths. We don't want to follow our stupidity anymore. We want to follow the path of righteousness. We want to learn of His ways. Would it not be wonderful if somebody showed up every Sunday at the doorstep of Grace Baptist Church that was a new person that walked in and said, I'm tired of walking in the world's ways. And I am tired of walking in the paths that have led to destruction. I have destroyed my own life. I have destroyed my own family. I have destroyed my own health. And I want to walk in the paths of righteousness. I think we'd have a hallelujah moment here at Grace. I think even you stodgy Baptists might put a hand up in the air <laughs> and get excited about Jesus. I'm not saying you're not excited, but what I'm saying is that it would do something to us mentally. Well, what's going to happen when the whole world is doing this? There will no longer be this desire for the people to merely feel at one with the universe. There will be a desire for them to feel at one with the maker of the universe. There will no longer be a desire for them to achieve a zen-like state. There will only be a desire for them to be at peace with the Creator. There will no longer be a desire for the people to be at war with each other. There is no longer be a desire for the people to feel that they need to be at one with nature. There will only be a desire 
to walk with the one who has made nature. This is a big view verse. This is a large-scale conversion. This is the ascendancy of Jesus Christ on earth. This is the climax of the story. This is why I'm in this fight. Because one day, all of those people who have turned uh, themselves against the Lord will be dealt with. And the people that remain will say, it is Him alone that we must serve. I am in this fight because I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that my general one day will be exalted above all generals. I know that one day my king will be exalted above all kings and that his throne will be above all thrones and that the people will come unto it. This is why I'm in this thing. I'm not in it for today. I'm not in it for Nathan Bramlett. I'm not in it to get out of hell. I'm in it because I know who the king is. And if I know who the king is, then my knees must bow in worship to him. And my heart must be surrendered in service to him. It astounds me at how many people want to hide their Christianity when you go to work. Listen, if your Christianity doesn't show when you go to work, what are you doing? Jesus Christ has saved you. If he has saved you, some not a show because the heart has been changed and one day all the world is going to recognize it why not get in on it early Micah's contemporary and if I had time I'd go there but you can look it up his contemporary Isaiah in chapter 2 verses 2 to 4 declares the same thing where is all this going to come from it will be located in a renewed Jerusalem in Zion. Verse 12 of chapter 3, He had it in heaps, but while God has declared destruction on His holy city, He will not utterly destroy it. We see this is how God works. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was stripped naked. Jesus had His beard plucked off of His face. Jesus wore a crown of thorns. Jesus was killed as a criminal. He faced the lowest of the low uh, execution that any man could face. But when it came to his burial, <laughs> God would not have his son lay in a criminal's grave. He said, it's enough. I've been satisfied. And Joseph of Arimathea came along and put Jesus in a tomb that said, just borrowing for a couple of days. God's wrath had been satisfied, but he would not let his dear son be thrown into a trash heap. Rather, he borrowed a wealthy man's tomb. This is how God works. While Jerusalem is being destroyed and being turned into rubble, it will one day be the most beautiful city, the crown jewel of this earth. Verse 3 shows us the antithesis of the present age that Jesus declares that we are living in. This is the same idea as in Mark 13, 8. Our present age is marked by strife, but a day is coming when the earth will be filled with farmers, not fighters. And the whole earth will be cultivated. And you hear the old Negro spiritual, I ain't going to study war no more. I ain't going to study war. This is the verse that it's based on. This is the idea that it's presenting. That the useless UN that sits in New York City and does absolutely nothing to help this world will be replaced by the King of Kings who will sit in Jerusalem and who will bring peace. Verse 4 describes us what this peace will look like practically. Peace will be universal, but it will be enjoyed personally. The idea that's given in verse 4 is that there will be those living during the millennium who will enjoy enough peace as to create lasting beauty. There is not enough peace in this world to create lasting beauty. Do you know uh, when Libya, uh, not Libya, Lebanon, first became a nation and, and, and things were really going well in the early part of the 1900s, the nation was beautiful. It was a beautiful nation. And then as the Muslims took over and as the infighting began, it's now, it's, it's rubble. It's bombed out. Beirut was a city of beauty and it's, it's nothing now. It's the same in Syria. Damascus was a city of beauty, but it's, it's under destruction and duress all the time. 
This is what is being talked about here, that there will come a time when all of these places that have been plagued by war will be a place of beauty and they will be marked by the cultivation of the people. Miss America desires world peace. Remember, every time they ask the question, give us three things that you'd like to change in this world. Um, uh, world peace and, uh, uh, world peace and, and maybe peace in the world. You know that the lady's bombed if she misses world peace. And she's gone. She's not going to make it. She's not going to get the scholarship because the world is looking for peace, peace, peace. But the reality is clear. Only Jesus brings real peace. And there's coming a day when the North Korean Christians who right now worship in fear of the Kim dynasty, they will one day be worshiping openly and creating things of beauty. This is a sure promise that has been spoken by the mouth of the Lord of hosts. That's what verse 4 declares. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. Verse 5, I'm hurrying. Here is an acknowledgement for the current situation. This gives us that, you you remember, none of you are so old that you remember silent movies, but back in the old silent movies, and the only reason why I remember them is because of history. I like history, so I look at historical things. And if you've ever watched an old silent movie, they always had a phrase in there to, to indicate that they were going back to a previous event, and the phrase was always the same. It would pop up on a black screen, and it would say, meanwhile, back at the ranch. <laughs> And it takes you back to something that was happening earlier on. Verse 4 is our meanwhile back at the ranch slide. During this time, the pagan is this time, this earth, during this earth, right now, the pagan will walk after their gods, but what are we going to do? We will walk in the name of our God. We will do now what is unpopular. We will hope expectantly for the day when it will be popular, but until then, we will do now what is unpopular. And how long will we walk this way? Forever. Is this not the path of the Christian? We walk in God's path knowing full well that it does not endear us to the world. Am I right? If you tell somebody you read your Bible, they'll say to you, why do you read that antiquated book? Inevitably, you'll have some pugnacious person who, who, who thinks that they're just so full of themselves and they have understanding on all things wise and knowledgeable. They'll say to you, well, you know, the Bible's been proven wrong time and time again. <laughs> you know what I love to say to those people? Show me one place. Show me one place. They cannot do it. They are just burping up the, the, the bifurcated mess that the, the cows that are in the, the universities today are forcing down their throats. These people that stand in these secular colleges, they have an agenda. You know what their agenda is? Their agenda is to take our young people and rob them of any faith that they might have. And place them back in the community that they find themselves in faithless, and atheistic. And that's what's happening today. I said earlier that they hate us. But despite the fact that they hate us, what are we going to do? The prophet's answer is clear. We will walk in the name of our God because we do not know anywhere else to walk. Verse 6 helps us to answer the question as to whether or not God is finally done with Israel. Jerusalem, the city, has a future, but does Judah the people? The answer is yes. God has determined their destruction, but he also planned for their return. After the judgment, God will bring back his people. And verse 7 indicates to us that while it will be a remnant, it will not be a small remnant. God will ultimately bring Israel back into a position of strength. They were lame, they were dispersed, but they will be brought back together. Who is going to do this? The Lord himself. The remnant is the fruit of God's restoration and preservation. 
Israel is not going to be say, able to say, kudos to us for enduring to the end. <laughs> That's not how it works. God's people, Israel, will be brought back together because of his preserving grace. Is that not the same song that we have? Why are you here this morning? Why did you show up this morning? I'll tell you why I showed up. Because there were a bunch of people expecting me, and if I didn't show up, Pastor Kay would have to get up here and have... No, that's not why I showed up. You know why I showed up? Because almost 30 years ago, God interrupted my life. And since that time, He has preserved and protected me for such a time as this. And I'm here today, by God's grace, to declare to you that He is King. Worship Him. That's why I'm here. Not because I'm good. Not because I've done good things. But I'm here because He is good. And He has done good things. And He has brought me to this point. But I don't want you to allow commonality between the church and Israel to obscure the division. Israel is Israel, and the church is the church. Nevertheless, we see plainly that God's character is similar in his dealings with both, and he will reign over them forever. John Calvin said, When God assures us that his assistance will last to the very end, indeed without end, and that in life and in death we shall feel his protection and safekeeping, what greater assurance could we want? Verse 8, there's some speculation concerning verse 8, and I want to be clear with you about what I am about to say. At this moment, if you're a person who is prone to conspiracy theories, I would like you to tune out for a few seconds, and I'm going to talk to the rest of us sensible people uh, who, who believe that the conspiracy theorists now look pretty smart after having lived through 2020. <laughs> what I'm saying is this. There is a possibility that this place that is mentioned in verse 8 that is called the Tower of the Flock it was a place near Bethlehem, and it was called Migdal Eder, and Edersham talks about this, and in English we call it the Tower of the Flock. And this is where the sacrificial lambs were raised near Bethlehem in order to be used for the temple. And it's possible, I'm saying this, possible, I am not preaching this, I am saying this, that it's possible that this is where Jesus Christ himself was born near this area. It would fit the sacrificial system. What I am saying for sure, though, what is beyond uh, rebuke that we find in this verse, is that the people are being told that the kingdom is coming. And this kingdom is the same kingdom that is in verse 7. And this kingdom is coming to the daughter of Zion because God is not finished with his people Israel. And we today are to do our best to live right now. I, I want to say this because this was an aha moment for me this week. Do you know how the Christian is supposed to live his life right now? He is to live his life as if he were already in the millennium. As if Jesus Christ were already king and as if everybody was already flowing unto him. We're supposed to live our lives like that. We are working here. Uh, the, this is why Dr. Finnegan says that this, this life is the kindergarten for eternity. We're practicing, getting ready for what he is ultimately going to accomplish. So how can we conclude? Who is like the Lord when he reigns? Amen? If the ushers...